Hello, everyone. My name is Micah Prayer, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's presentation, Digital Accessibility Fundamentals for Websites, Documents, and Videos. With a rapidly changing digital environment, digital accessibility is crucial for creating a truly inclusive world for everyone. For people with disabilities, it means equal access to online education, healthcare, employment, and e-commerce. In the age of social media, it even means equal access to friendship and social growth. Digital accessibility also fosters independence. It empowers users with disabilities to navigate websites, use digital products without assistance, and opens up a world of information and resources that they may not have had access to in the past. I have the pleasure of serving as the Chief Information Officer for the Viscardi Center, and I'm joined today by my esteemed colleagues, Will Bubinick, Chief Accessibility Officer, Curb Cut OS, Jim Corporal, Digital Accessibility Services Coordinator, the Viscardi Center, and Lily Bond, Senior Vice President of Marketing, 3Play Media. We are so pleased that you could join us today to discuss this important topic. I'd like to start by noting that immediately following today's session, you'll be asked to complete a survey about your experience. The Viscardi Center encourages you to please do so in order to help us continue to provide valuable sessions moving forward. Now, most of you are joining us through the WebEx platform and are hearing the audio by voice over IP through your computers. For technical support during the training session, please post your issue within the chat window. For issues loading WebEx or downloading the add-ins, contact WebEx at 1-866-229-3239. Please note that we'll be accepting questions from the audience during today's discussion. You can submit your questions by typing them into the Q&A window located at the bottom right of the screen. We are also live captioning this training session, which you can follow along within the captioning window at the bottom right of the screen below the Q&A window. You must open the window titled Multimedia Viewer to display the captioning. Live captioning link is also available in the chat window located on the right of the screen if you wish to pop it out of the WebEx platform and into a web browser. And lastly, if you choose to use the automated captioning, you may do so by clicking on the closed captioning button located at the bottom left of the screen. Now, before getting started, we would like for you to answer one quick question. This is being asked to provide a sort of baseline of participants' knowledge and comfort level with our topic today. Please note that your responses are anonymous and answering the question honestly is essential to helping us understand your needs and our effectiveness. So please take a moment to answer it. The question should be appearing on the right-hand side of your screen. And that question is, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your understanding of digital accessibility services and why it is important? Please use this scale, one equals very little understanding, while five equals extensive understanding. And let's, let's wait a few seconds while WebEx tallies up the responses. Okay, so I see a lot of threes and fours. Uh, so hopefully by the end of today's session, We'll be able to get those to more on the four and five level. Now, let's get started with today's session. So, what is digital accessibility? Digital accessibility refers to the inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to websites, digital tools, and technologies by people with disabilities. When it comes to students, we are leveling the playing field for education by providing assistive access and assistive tools and assistive content to those students to complete their coursework. We are empowering people with disabilities by creating independence and retaining fulfilling employment and performing at a high level. It's providing a culture of inclusion at your organization. And the word that you're going to hear a lot during our session today is access, providing access to people with disabilities to the work environment, school environment, and to online digital content. And lastly, is also to, to equate digital access, it is a digital front door to your organization and business. Think about ha having a brick and mortar store open to the public business and not having curb cuts or automatic doors or ramps to access that building. That is what digital access provides. There are three key components to 
digital accessibility, and they will all be discussed today in further detail. Uh, these topics are website accessibility, document accessibility, and accessibility in video and audio content. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our first panelist, Will Bubenick, Chief Accessibility Officer at CurbCut OS. Due to having three older siblings with disabilities, Will possesses extensive firsthand knowledge with understanding that people with disabilities don't have trouble access the world. It's the world that has been made inaccessible to them. Will has taken the personal experience and applied it professionally. With a proven expertise and demonstrated success of over 200 engagements across multiple industries, ranging from government to e-commerce and entities such as the Special Olympics International, Philadelphia 76ers, and level access while assisting other startups in the disability space. Will, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Uh, just again, as a quick aside, if anyone needs additional accommodations with those captionings, and most of my slides today are text only, but for those that may need any additional accommodations, I'll describe any figures and images that are on the slides. Uh, on this slide is our curb cut OS logo, just a text logo of our logo name. You go to the next slide, please. <laughs> so, of course, we're here to talk about the different areas of website and digital accessibility. What does that really mean? Mike gave a great introduction. I like to say it's the ramps and rails of the digital world. Everything that you put online, your website, your web apps, mobile apps, social media, video, audio, podcasts, documents, and more, all need to be coded and designed properly to ensure equal opportunity and access to all people. <laughs> Without digital accessibility, people with disabilities, a large portion of the population, is unable to fully access this online content. Many users with disabilities use what are called assistive technologies, like a screen reader, or they navigate the web entirely by using a keyboard and not a mouse. And you would think that websites would be inherently designed so you could access them properly, right? Well, there was a study that was done against the compliance standards, the web content accessibility guidelines. And the study showed that the top 1 million home pages on the web, 96.8% of them failed basic accessibility checks like color contrast, alternative text, and more. So with all of this in mind, it can definitely feel overwhelming, but my goal here is to help you break this down into a process, assess, identify, modify, and retest with these end goals of not just ensuring compliance with these accessibility compliance standards, but also having the net benefits of improving the user experience and ultimately reaching a wider audience through your accessible content. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the image that's on the slide right now is a demonstration of what's called the curb cut effect. When we design for disabilities, we make things better for everyone. You might be wondering the meaning behind our name curb cut OS. This is an embodiment of the curb cut effect. This refers to the unintended positive consequences of a design innovation that was originally intended to address a specific problem. So when you look at the infographic of curb cuts, these sloped cuts on street corners that make sidewalks accessible for wheelchair users, this also benefited other groups like parents with strollers, travelers with luggage, people making deliveries and the like. This curb cut effect illustrates how designing for accessibility can have a ripple effect, creating positive impacts for a much larger population than just those with disabilities. That's what we're trying to replicate here at Curb Cut OS. We're inspired by the curb cut effect and the idea that designing for accessibility can have a broader positive impact. We believe that by creating these accessible digital assets that we can make the online world more inclusive and accessible for everyone and not just those with disabilities. Our name reflects that mission, and we're looking to create what is called the digital curb cut effect. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, what's on the slide right now are just four different graphics of testing, reporting, fixing, and training. So with this in mind, let's dive into this process of what is it that you truly need to have in an accessibility solution and an accessibility offer. At a high level, you need to be able to test to identify issues at various phases of your accessibility journey, understand how to report those things to ensure that they're captured in a meaningful way, fix those issues at the source code level, and ultimately provide ongoing training to ensure that these issues are understood amongst the team and implemented for the long term. 
we can go to the next slide, please. So the first slide here is talking about the testing phases, and I have different icons uh, representing different types of tools that you can use in the testing process. Uh, we can start by utilizing automated testing tools, such as WAVE that is offered through the company WebAIM, or the Axe Core Library rule set that's offered through DQ. These are just a couple of, so of examples that you can utilize when looking to identify accessibility issues automatically against these different types of standards and guidelines. Not all issues, though, can be identified automatically. You also need to think about the human component, manual testing and functional testing with real users that are utilizing these assistive technologies. It's one thing to actually check off a compliance box. It's another to actually make sure that these are usable and accessible by the end user community. So utilizing assistive technologies like the JAWS screen reader, and that is not the JAWS movie, that is job access with speech. And then looking at other screen readers like the NVDA screen reader, as well as the voiceover screen reader that is utilized on Mac and iOS devices. You want to ensure that you're testing with different types of assistive technologies based on the different types of environments that your users might be coming from, whether we're utilizing desktop access or mobile access, whether it's a web application or a mobile app, there's different types of behaviors that these different types of assistive technologies will provide. Ultimately, when you're looking to do these types of tests, there's different types of certifications that you can attain, whether it's through the IAAP, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, or going through the Section 508 Trusted Tester Certification Program. Uh, not all accessibility audits and tests are created equal, so you want to ensure that you're procuring a solution that is reputable and respected across the accessibility community. If we can go to the next slide, please. It's one thing to test these issues. This slide is pretty much all text with just the reporting icon. It's another to actually report and identify these issues. After you go through, different reporting options include these automated assessments that can identify these accessibility issues which is roughly 30 to 40% of all of the web content accessibility guidelines criteria. The remaining 60 to 70% has to be tested manually with actual end users with disabilities, utilizing these assistive technologies through manual and functional testing methods. Once these things are identified, you can provide these different types of report logs that include things like, what URL are we testing on? What platform and operating system and what browser are we using? because different things might behave differently in different types of system browser and platform operating system combinations. What types of tests are we provi providing? What is the conformance target? And what types of WCAG, Section 508, or whatever types of guidelines are we working with to ensure that we're measuring against those standards? What is the expected result versus the actual result? Of course, those things vary in terms of how we're trying to access it with these various assistive technologies. Humanizing the experience and showing visuals by looking at what types of users are affected and the user impacts of those issues. The technical side of identifying what are the code snippets involved, the steps to reproduce that issue, and show screenshots and videos of really understanding how this issue is being identified and the blockers that are preventing them from completing that particular task. It's one thing to identify those issues, which I'll talk about on the next slide, but it's another to then provide detailed remediation guidance from the technical side, as well as the user experience side, to ensure it's not just passing these technical requirements, but also ensuring that it's usable and accessible to all people. From there, the different reporting options that can come from this include things like an accessibility statement. I like to compare it to a terms of service or a privacy policy, something that lives in the, in the footer of your website that demonstrates your commitment to accessibility for the long term. You also can put it into something that's called a VPAT, a Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. This is oftentimes used <clears throat> when working with different government entities or looking in the procurement process if you're looking to sell products and solutions to education institutions or government bodies. Having a VPAT essentially serves like an accessibility report card. How do these necessary accessibility standards support, partially support, or do not support your product when looking to sell to these different types of entities? And you also can provide an accessibility compliance report 
that details all of these things in different formats so that the necessary people can get the information that they need. We can go to the next slide, please. After we identify all of these things, of course, then we want to go into the remediation phase. On this slide is just the icon that we have for fixing these necessary issues. Curb Cut OS, we do not embrace the accessibility overlay model because we do believe that things need to be remediated at the source code level. There's different methods to providing remediation, whether it's through manual methods, automated testing methods, or a hybrid testing method. Ultimately, this needs to be a collaboration because there might be root causes of where this actual issue might be occurring. It could be in the development phase. It could be in the design phase. It could be when content creators are putting new blog posts up there. But also you want to include the end users, actual users with disabilities, when looking at how to prioritize your remediation roadmap. Sometimes we work with clients where we're able to see that there might be hundreds, if not thousands of accessibility issues. And that can be very overwhelming to start. But ultimately what we're trying to strive for here is progress over perfection. We want to try and implement this continuous improvement, monitor these things, prioritize things by severity, how much of a blocker it might be, what things might be related to third party issues, how can we actually build this into a roadmap so we're not implementing what we like to call this break fix model. This is something where if you're not embracing accessibility throughout the entirety of your software process design and development, it'll turn into where we have to go through, we didn't make it accessible, it'll, it gets broken, we need to fix it, we don't do anything to prevent it for the long term, it breaks again, and then we have this continuous cycle of break, fix, break, fix. So we're trying to help implement that here through this continuous improvement, monitoring these issues, and tying into the last variable, if we go to the next slide, please, of training. We're really big proponents of the icon here is just demonstrating different trainings that we provide here, is giving a person a fish versus teaching a person to fish. We really want people to understand why these issues are happening and how to prevent them in the future. As mentioned on the previous slide, some things might be related directly to the design phase. Others might be related to the technical implementation or things like just not adding alternative text when we're presenting and putting out a blog post. Providing role specific trainings provides the organization with the confidence and understanding that they know that accessibility is going to be a key part of their workflows moving forward. We can go to the next slide, please. This is embodied here on this infographic here the cost of accessibility bugs. Uh, this infographic, I, the visualization of this is that as the longer that you go to discover an accessibility bug, the more it'll cost your organization to fix it. If we start in the conception and design phases, accessibility goes down significantly. And there's various tools and services and processes that help you to identify accessibility issues related to color contrast or UX and design elements. When you move into the development phase, looking at things like component-based libraries. How are we ensuring that all of the necessary components, pages, templates, everything that we're going to be using is accessible via all of these different compliance standards and usability guidelines? It's one thing to make sure that all of these necessary components are passing all of these guidelines. It's another to ensure that all of these things work together when you're putting it on the live web application, website, mobile app, whatever it might be. A great analogy that I like to use is that you can make all of these bricks as accessible as possible, and they're very strong bricks, but you can put these bricks together in a very flimsy way. So the accessibility process doesn't end after the development phase. You want to ensure as you're putting these websites and web pages and mobile apps together with these accessible components, that they flow and have proper navigation elements that come with it. A lot of times people engage with us, unfortunately, at the release phase where accessibility oftentimes becomes very cost prohibitive. That's where we see a lot of people have these initial objections about the cost of accessibility. But if you look at looking at implementing accessibility early on in the conception and design phases and flipping the model on its head, it really gives you the ability to embrace accessibility throughout the entirety of your design and development lifecycle. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So the 
image on the screen here is the book called Personality Isn't Permanent by Benjamin Hardy. Uh, I'll leave you with this here. Uh, ultimately, the main message that I like to talk about here is will it make the boat go faster? So one of the main ideas in this book is that in 1998, the Great Britain Olympic men's rowing team asked themselves that question as they were training for a gold medal at the Olympic Games. They realized in order to win a gold medal, they had to go faster. So from this realization, they decided to only do things that would help them make the boat go faster. And they applied this to every single area of their lives. The things that they ate, the things that they did, the things that they consumed, it all came from the frame of reference of, will it make the boat go faster? If it did, they would do it. And if not, they wouldn't. So an example would be when presented with eating a Big Mac versus a salad, they would ask themselves, will it make the boat go faster? And if the answer was no, they wouldn't do it. And it sounds like a really simple concept, but how often in our own lives do we do something that is completely outside the opposite and detrimental to the goal that we're actually trying to seek? And so the point that I'm trying to make here is not to make you a rowing gold medalist per se, but rather to consider that this is ultimately a mindset shift and you want to embrace what I call this accessibility mindset and constantly ask yourself this following question. If we can go to the next slide, please. Will this make our online experience more accessible? That's the point ultimately of this entire webinar is embracing what we call the accessibility mindset. You're ultimately not this anti-accessibility evil villain if you haven't done any of these things from the start or you're just starting your accessibility journey. This webinar ultimately has no intention of making you feel like one. But by breaking down some of these true intentions and some of the key considerations of accessibility in your website and in your content, you can really begin to develop this accessibility mindset. And from there, things will start to fall into place because accessibility won't feel like a burden, but an opportunity. And designs and products won't be great despite accessibility, but because of it. And ultimately you can get accessibility right just by changing the way that you think about it. Will it make the boat go faster? Will this make our online experience more accessible? And you can develop that accessibility mindset and it won't be too hard. That is all I have. I want to thank you for listening to my section and I'll hand it over to our other presenters. Great. Thank you, Will. Uh, I'm very positive the information that you shared today will be a great benefit to all our participants. Um, I do want to mention uh, for those in the chat window, um, the best viewing experience to view the presentation slides will be if you download the WebEx app versus using the web browser. Once you will, uh, once you're in with using the app, you can click on the section where it says viewing webinar March 23, 2023 20, in the drop down option, you just above the side panel. There's also a downward arrow to allow you selection if you don't see it. So um, best viewing experience always with platforms such as WebEx and Zoom is to use the actual platform app versus a web browser. So now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our second panelist. Uh, Jim Corporal, Digital Accessibility Services Coordinator at the Viscardi Center. With an information technology solutions background of over 25 years spanning multiple industries, Jim is responsible for overseeing and growing digital accessibility services at the Viscardi Center, which ensures that electronic documents, websites, and multimedia files are fully accessible to people with visual and physical disabilities using assistive technologies and screen reading software. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Next slide, please. Welcome again, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. You can move forward there, Mike. So I'm going to focus today on document accessibility. Like we said, we look at three components to digital accessibility, websites, digital documents and files, and then uh, captioning videos, post-production and, and live time captioning as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what exactly it is how we accomplish it and why it's important to do that. There's gonna be some common threads uh, between uh, all of our presenters today in terms of what you'll be hearing in, uh, regarding uh, legal aspects, uh, social inclusion aspects and, and business case uh, aspects as well. So uh, next slide, please, Mike. 
<clears throat> so what types of documents should be made accessible? There are many. Uh, employee handbooks, for example, job applications. These are all uh, documents that we uh, commonly see on websites, uh, mortgage applications for banks, uh, legacy documents. Quite often, uh, we might only have a hard copy of a document that we then have to scan and convert to an electronic or digital format. We have to run it through some optical character recognition software to make sure that it's readable, and then we make it accessible from there. Training materials. Uh, here at the Viscardi Center, we have our Henry Viscardi School, which is a, a K through 12 New York State accredited school. Uh, we have uh, over 170 severely disabled children. Uh, we've been making uh, their school materials accessible for, for many years now so that when they would go home at the end of the day, they wouldn't have to rely on a sibling or a parent to do their homework. Um, they, they were independent. Um, uh, student worksheets, bank loan applications, again, all p uh, materials, documents that are required to be accessible um, from various uh, organizations and associations. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, detail regarding document accessibility. I'm going to try not to get into the weeds here, but I think it's important to kind of show a little bit of uh, behind the scenes uh, aspects of what it takes to make a digital document accessible. The term is remediation. You'll hear that a lot today. Uh, it, it basically means making something digitally accessible. Um, it's a software coding process where we make sure that documents such as uh, PDF files, Microsoft Word documents, uh, PowerPoint templates or uh, presentations, uh, even Excel spreadsheets. Uh, we do a behind the scenes kind of coding uh, process where we make and mark headings. Uh, we identify when there's a heading, a title in the document. We identify when there are photos and graphics uh, pie charts, things like that, that require alternative text description. If the document is a form, uh, for example, where we have to insert fillable fields, uh, text boxes, check boxes, radio buttons, and things like that, uh, these are all processes that we do in the background uh, so that assistive technology, uh, the software that Will had mentioned earlier, so JAWS, NVDA, uh, even um, for mobile devices, talk back and uh, voiceover. Uh, if these software applications come upon these documents, these websites that aren't remediated, aren't made accessible, they won't be able to uh, read aloud, essentially, the content back to the, the viewer. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. So here we have a, a screenshot of a, a document. It's a Biscardi document. Uh, it is uh, displayed using the Adobe Acrobat uh, Pro DC tool, and it's uh, one of the tools that we use to remediate documents. Uh, I'm, I'm showing in this screen uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the accessibility tool has been uh, opened, <clears throat> excuse me, and the tags panel is shown. And anyone familiar with uh, HTML programming, you might notice that some of these tags are quite familiar to HTML coding of websites, and there's a lot of overlapping between uh, website technology and the digital document technology remediation that we're showing here today. Uh, in particular, there is a figure tag on the left-hand side with a red arrow pointing to uh, a Viscardi or Abilities Inc. logo. Uh, below that is another tag that is pointing to a title in this document, and that's a heading uh, tag. And below those tags, there's a, a whole host of um, paragraph tags, and, and those are what they sound like. They identify text content within a document. If you were to uh, open a document in Acrobat that hasn't been remediated and you open the accessibility tool in the tags pane, you would not see any of these tags here. And that's one indication that the document isn't uh, made accessible. Uh, next uh, slide, please, Mike. Okay, so how is it accomplished? How do we remediate these documents? And it's a little bit of an art and a science. Uh, it begins with uh, document authoring. So quite often we create documents using Microsoft Word. 
Um, sometimes we have uh, InDesign, Adobe InDesign files that we convert ultimately to a PDF. Sometimes we have um, PDF editing software, Google Docs, again, PowerPoints. Uh, it starts with the authoring of those documents and we can utilize uh, specific tools within um, the, the, those software to make sure that there's accessibility features built in to the document uh, from the beginning, and, th and that's great. There's still always work to be done once we get past that step, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute and, and how we go about doing that. But ultimately, we then take those uh, digital files, we run them through automation software. Uh, we have proprietary software here that actually tags or remediates these files and uh, gets us kind of started on, on the journey of making it fully compliant. Um, there's uh, a certain amount of technical checks, again, uh, we'll touch on this earlier, that uh, based on computer algorithms, we can check for and make sure that uh, these documents um, have the accessibility features applied to them. Uh, these tools will also identify where we are falling short in those areas. Uh, though we generate reports and from there we'll get into a, a manual intervention. So, for example, a document might uh, be very simple. It might just simply be a, a textual mem memo, one page. Uh, usually our software will get these documents remediated almost 90% of the way to full compliance. Uh, if it's a, a complex document where the document has uh, charts, images, tables, uh, website links, email links. Uh, these documents require more manual intervention uh, where we then go in and we use specific tools to go ahead and apply accessibility features to them. That's all part of that manual intervention. There's a little bit of an art there in the sense that when we get to items such as the graphics, for example, uh, graphics re require something called alternative text description. This is a, a quite common feature in accessibility. Many of our clients, probably many of you uh, attending today are aware of that particular feature where we have to create descriptions of those images so that when that assistive technology screen reading software, JAWS, NVDA, comes upon those images in these documents, the images are described uh, correctly. Now, there's an important distinction here that I want to make in that when we have technical checks, these programs will check for characters, program characters, coding characters in these fields for these images. They can be completely inaccurate. They can be the letter X or the number nine to describe an image perhaps of, uh, of Jim that you saw earlier. Uh, technically, that's going to pass our, our checkers, but uh, from a usability perspective, obviously that's that's incorrect, and that's where we bring in the manual intervention, where we have to apply human inspection to make sure that these documents have the correct uh, alternative descriptions for all their images, all their website links, labels for some of the form fields, and so on and so forth. Also, part of the quality assurance is we check for the correct reading order. Again, software cannot identify the proper reading order of these documents. Uh, typically, we read from left to right, top to bottom, uh, and that's great, again, in a simple document, but if we have a document that's kind of a newspaper format where it's multiple columns, we have to make sure that we let the uh, software, the assistive technology, know what reading order to, to uh, scan through those documents. All part of quality assurance. Once we're uh, happy with that, then we deliver back to uh, our customers. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. I just wanted to show here the accessibility checkers that I kind of just mentioned. Uh, on the left-hand side is a graphic uh, or a screenshot of an Adobe file open in Adobe Acrobat. And on the right is, uh, is the information section for an MS Word uh, file. And you can see that uh, there are the uh, accessibility features or checkers built into these two tools. Um, I encourage you when you get back to your desks or the office, your computer to maybe open up an MS Word doc and see if you can't uh, see the accessibility checker and just play with it a little bit and get a sense for uh, what uh, needs to be done in terms of remediating these documents. Uh, 
the Adobe, uh, you, it's, uh, Adobe Acrobat is kind of uh, the reader on steroids. Unless you have the uh, Acrobat Pro DC tool, you won't be able to see these features here. Uh, so if you have reader, don't go looking for it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how is it accomplished? We have a screenshot here again of the uh, Viscardi document, the abilities document. It's actually a form. It's an education reference form. It's pre uh, remediated. It has a screenshot of the PDF checker, the uh, PDF accessibility checker indicating uh, a red X uh, that will alert us to the fact that the document is not fully compliant. There are a bunch of green check marks, which is great, but there are a couple of red X's there that um, are indicating that uh, additional work needs to, to be done on this file. Next slide, please, Mike. And here we are now with that same document, but uh, it's been fully remediated and the uh, screenshot is showing that document with a green arrow or check in the pack checker indicating that the document is fully compliant. There's no more red X's. Uh, so we're, we're good to go from, again, a technical perspective here. Uh, you might also notice that uh, some of the uh, fields in the form have now kind of changed the visual shape. We have uh, circles where we have in, um, input or created radio buttons, which in, uh, are used to determine true or false values, a yes or no answer to a question, uh, text input fields. For example, someone needs to uh, indicate or, or write in their name, uh, a date, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are of the tasks that are required in order to make a document fully accessible. And we apply labels to those fields, again, so that when the assistive technology comes upon those uh, fields, uh, it's read aloud to the user and they know what information that they're uh, looking to be provided. Next slide, please, Mike. Okay, so why is it important? Again, is a common theme here. Uh, there's a legal risk perspective and there's, there's laws and, and guidelines uh, around the legal aspect of accessibility. Section 508 WCAG guidelines. Lily's gonna talk a little bit more about them uh, later on. We'll touch upon them as well. Uh, so I'm going to jump to uh, the business case perspective, uh, why organizations from a, a simply dollars and cents perspective should be addressing accessibility. And then, of course, the, uh, the idea of social inclusion. Quite frankly, if you take care of the business case and the social inclusion, your legal risk, risk perspective or uh, burden goes away. And it's, it's, it's a rather nice, I guess, outcome of addressing uh, accessibility from the business case and social inclusion perspective. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about uh, some information, how we can back up those, those ideas. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. Okay, so the business case. Uh, there's a, uh, an expression I like to use, torture the numbers long enough, they'll tell you anything you want them to, right? So we have some numbers here. These are studies uh, that um, have been performed, disability in, Accenture, uh, these are uh, have reported that companies that lead in disability inclusion show a 28% higher revenue, two times higher net income, and 30% better performance on profit margin. So the spirit here is that if you address accessibility, and again, you can do it uh, at that design uh, phase that Will mentioned earlier, uh, the cost is greatly reduced, yet the benefit to the company from a, a dollars and cents perspective grows exponentially as you, you go throughout uh, the development of your either your applications or you're making your documents accessible or you're making your videos um, accessible through captioning and so on and so forth. It's estimated 57 million Americans have some form of disability, and that number grows, especially as uh, baby boomers are aging into retirement and uh, are starting to um, experience age-related disabilities. Um, in the marketplace, if you could make your products, your services, your materials accessible, you essentially now have access to those 57 million people. Um, that's quite a formidable number from a marketing perspective. Uh, so just think how nice it would be if you were just to tackle digital accessibility, you would have access to 
literally millions more potential customers. I will say that um, people with uh, different abilities are a very loyal um, demographic group. I know personally, if I need a, a plumber or electrician, I have a, a person that I go to, I trust them, I go back to them time and time again because I know that they're going to provide a good service for me, they're gonna provide it at a reasonable and fair cost. The same thing when you address digital accessibility, you will have your customers repeat. Again, another little number, five times, more, costs five times more to get a new customer than it does to keep an existing customer. So your business case right there should just be enough to go ahead and, and address digital accessibility and make it part of your organization's culture. Next slide, please, Mike. Okay, lastly, social inclusion and, and perhaps maybe the most important here. Digital accessibility and making these materials accessible just completely boost employee productivity within organizations, not only in the role of hiring, retaining, and even in advancing these individuals. Um, it's immensely important to provide uh, this type of service in school settings, of course, where we give access to school children so that they can uh, grow, that they can be educated. I can't tell you how many wonderful stories we have here at uh, the Viscardi School about some of our students who, if they did not have access to this material, the, the ideas, the uh, opportunities that uh, are offered to them and that they present to uh, the rest of the world um, would be sorely missed. Again, customers navigating to your websites, uh, they can shop your apps, they can use your, your services. Uh, individuals in, in, in the mature communities uh, have a much more active involvement and participation in those communities. And again, um, if that's not enough to, to convince you, it's, it's essentially the, the right thing to do. We're, we're gaining, uh, we're giving access to everyone uh, so that everyone can grow, develop, uh, and be successful. Again, social inclusion and um, business case perspectives uh, will certainly uh, take care of your legal risk perspective. So with that said, I'm just gonna wrap up my section. I'm gonna hand it back to Mike and thank you for listening today. Great, thanks, Jim. Uh, the information you shared today will be great benefit to our participants. And we'll move on to our third and final panelist. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Lily Bond. Lily serves as the Vi Senior Vice President of Marketing at 3Play Media, the industry's leading provider of media accessibility services. Lily has published content on the topics of closed captioning and accessibility for over eight years and currently oversees all marketing programs and strategies. Lily, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so I'm going to cover video accessibility 101, another kind of critical and different aspect of digital accessibility. And I will go through uh, captioning, live captioning and audio description requirements uh, for media. Next slide. So, 1st of all, um, to get on the same page, uh, what are captions? Captions are text that has been time synchronized with the videos audio track and appear on screen while a video is playing. Um, a lot of times people use the, the terms captions and subtitles interchangeably, and in some countries, uh, subtitles refer to both. Um, but in the US, uh, they actually refer to different things. So captions uh, assume that the viewer can't hear the audio, whereas subtitles assume that the viewer doesn't understand the language. So subtitles are intended to translate audio, and captions are intended to create a text alternative of that audio. Um, and then transcripts are plain text versions uh, of the audio in a video video that isn't time coded um, and can be shared as a separate document. Next slide. There are several laws in the US that do require captioning um, and require web accessibility more broadly. I won't go into these in depth, but um, at a high level, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is uh, a, a law, it's a broad accessibility law that does require captioning and, and web accessibility um, under sections 504 and section 508 uh, and uh, uh, applies specifically to federal and federally funded programming. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 
has two titles, Title II and Title III, that affect closed captioning and web accessibility. This applies to public entities and places of public accommodation. And this is the area that has been under the most litigation um, recently for broad web accessibility lawsuits. Um, there have been over, there were over 4,000 of these in 2022, and the number has risen every year. Um, so uh, this is kind of a critical area of broad web accessibility litigation that, that organizations should care about. Uh, this is in both the private and, and public sector. And then uh, a very niche law, if you are in the entertainment and streaming space, is the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. This applies all of the really rigorous broadcast FCC regulations uh, to the web. So anything that previously appeared on television with captioning must be captioned when it's streamed online. Um, so if you think about, you know, if you are a fan of The Bachelor, uh, that if you are watching it streamed online must be captioned because it appeared on television with captions. And all of these uh, really reference the web content accessibility guidelines, uh, which both um, Will and Jim have mentioned, uh, but these are international standards for web accessibility and do cover video accessibility. Next slide. So uh, a, a fun trivia question that I often use uh, is what was the first television show to air with closed captions? And on the next slide, uh, you'll see the, the answer. Um, it is uh, Julia Child's The French Chef in 1972. There is a picture of Julia Child uh, in that show on the screen. Um, and this came out of WGBH. Next slide. So uh, captioning uh, on its own isn't enough. You need to make sure that you have quality captioning and several lawsuits have called out inaccurate captioning or what you might consider auto captions as not being sufficient to, to create an equal experience for people with disabilities. So some of the, the best practices here are a 99% plus accuracy rate. That means, you know, one in 100 words is wrong. That uh, that number deprecates really quickly. So if you're looking at, uh, you know, speech recognition only, which is say 85% accurate, that means one in every seven words has an error, um, which is a really big impact to the experience um, and certainly does not create an equal experience for people with disabilities. And you also wanna make sure that those captions are readable. So there are best practices here, like frame requirements, making sure that you don't have too much text on the screen and that it doesn't take up uh, you know, too many lines. Um, similarly, using a font that is readable, you want sentence case, and you wanna make sure that the captions are placed so that they don't obst obstruct anything relevant uh, on the screen. So if there's a lower third uh, that, that has kind of the speaker name uh, in a documentary, for example, you would wanna move the captions to the top of the screen. Uh, next screen. So, uh, in the kind of live space, kind of, you know, the experience that we're having today, um, captions are, are uh, also provided for real time events, um, typically, you know, live broadcast, webinars, meetings, live conferences, uh, sporting events, um, you know, live classes. All of these are contexts in which you may require live captioning. And there are two, really two paths here. There are automatic captions and there are uh, captions that are produced by a human captioner. Those provide much higher uh, accuracy and, and are the direction you want to go if you have an accommodations request. Uh, there is more... Uh, more uh, leeway for latency with live captioning. Um, so whereas in the recorded space, captions should precisely match the spoken word uh, with live captions, it is common and expected to have slight latency between the spoken word and the delivery of captions. Um, some other terms you might hear in this space are LPC, that's live professional captioning with a human, CART, um, or communication access real-time translation, and ASR, or automatic speech recognition. Next slide. Some of the best practices for live captioning, uh, particularly uh, digital live captioning, you need to make sure you have a strong network connection. Um, so if the stream drops or the captioner loses access to your program, you can't deliver captions back to that. So having a clear network connection is critical. Clear speech and pronunciation is really, really critical. There is a person in real time trying to capture what you are saying, and the clearer you are, uh, the slower you speak. I'm 
a horrible example because I speak quickly, so I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, single speaker, good quality audio, you know, little to no background noise. All of those really help with the quality uh, of the captioning that you'll receive in real time. Next slide. And there are lots of benefits to, to captioning. Obviously, accessibility is a critical need here. There are 48 million Americans with hearing loss, um, but it's also really impactful for viewer engagement and for your brand. Um, so from a search engine optimization perspective, Google can't watch a video, but it can read the text of that video um, and rank for a much more diverse and broad keyword set. Um, and captions also improve engagement, focus, comprehension, uh, and viewer experience. Um, there, are, there are many studies that, that cover all of these benefits. Next slide. So uh, the other kind of side of media accessibility is audio description. This is a critical accommodation for blind and low vision users. In other parts of the country and, and the world, it can be referred to as descriptive video or video description. It's all the same thing. Audio description narrates the relevant visual information in a video um, to make sure that the blind audiences can access the critical information. And we have a quick video. Uh, showing what audio description is is like. Um, this is a a trailer of Frozen uh, with and there's no spoken audio. So if if you are uh, deaf, you're not missing anything. Um, the uh, audio description track will show uh, a good example of what this experience is like. Next slide. There are two types of audio description. You may need different ones in different contexts. There's standard and extended. Standard audio description fits description into the natural pauses in the video. And extended audio description actually extends the length of your source video to create space for description. If you have a video where there are very few pauses uh, and room to describe the relevant visual information, or you have a really heavily, heavily visual presentation, um, extended audio description may be required. Next slide. And similarly to, to captioning, um, not all audio description is created equal. So there are, are several qualities that we look for to, to create quality audio description. Um, the first is accuracy, um, you know, no errors in pronunciation and word selection and diction. Um, equal is the intended meaning of the program uh, conveyed accurately. Um, we want the, the tone of audio description to be consistent to the, the video. A cinematic experience is very different than a physics lecture, for example. Um, we want to prioritize the critical information necessary over uh, kind of irrelevant visual information. Um, and we want it to be appropriate to the audience. So that was an example of Frozen, very appropriate and fun for, for children um, and for the audience that is relevant. Next slide. And just like with captioning, there are lots of benefits to audio description, accessibility being the obvious one. Um, it's imperative for blind and low vision viewers, but it also creates a lot of other benefits like flexibility to view videos in eyes free environments. We've heard of people using videos with audio description, like a podcast on a, on a drive. Um, it is uh, legally required under several laws. Um, it helps with focus um, and it helps uh, you know people with with autism identify visual cues um, and it can also help with your brand to create inclusive design and equal access uh, next slide um, and that was it uh, for me so i will hand it back to mike thank you great thank you lily uh, the information you shared today will be a great benefit to our participants so now let's take some participant questions Please keep in mind that we will try and answer as many questions as we can. However, due to the number of participants and limited time, we may not have the capacity to answer all of them on this webinar. So please start entering your questions in the Q&A window below. Um, so to get things started, um, I have a question here for Jim and Will. Um, what is the best compliance certification for websites and documents? You want to go first, Jim, or do you want me to go? Uh, I I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Uh, well, it might be a little bit of overlap here. Uh, I know I A uh, I double A P. You mentioned them earlier. Has certification for uh, accessibility accessibility document specialists. So I know uh, that's a a great place to go. Uh, there's a lot of information on the I A P site. If you're not a member, I encourage you to become a member. Uh, of course, there's a, a ton of information on the various uh, online learning uh, platforms. LinkedIn used to be Linda. 
uh, com. Uh, a lot of material there that you can simply search for digital accessibility or document accessibility specifically, and you'll find uh, information about that. Um, hand it to you, Will. Absolutely. Um, so going off of Jim's question, from a professional development standpoint, you can have that IAAP, International Association of Accessibility Professional Certification. There's the CPAC, the Web Accessibility Specialist, Document Accessibility Specialist, a lot of different ones that you can work at there. Uh, if you're looking to get certified in the testing space uh, as well, looking at Sections 508 Trusted Tester Program. But if you're looking at, quote unquote, what are certifications for the actual accessibility standards, that isn't necessarily a thing. We're looking at the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. The current version of that is 2.1. There's three levels to WCAG or WCAG, single A, double A, and triple A. Organizations, most organizations should be striving for double A, which builds on top of single A, which is the bare minimum conformance criteria. So if you're looking at how to ensure compliance with those standards, you're going to want to first emphasize the single A criteria, which is the bare minimum. And then looking at the double A criteria, which builds on top of single A. Um, I give a running joke that if you want to do triple A, every single checkbox and check off every single box for WCAG, uh, your site will look like a newspaper. Mm -hmm. But uh, ultimately, it's your, the best approach would be to look at WCAG 2.1, single A and double A. Uh, looks like we got one here for Lily. Uh, where would a small business find someone to write and deliver audio description for YouTube videos? Great question. Um, so there are several vendors that provide audio description um, and the uh, uh, American Council for the Blind has a really great list of uh, providers, um, some individuals, some companies providing audio description um, at 3Play Media. We, we provide audio description to lots of, uh, you know, small companies as well as large enterprises for, for audio description and have options for both synthesized speech outputs and for voice acted audio description. Right. Uh, looks like another one here for you, Lily. Uh, can you speak on the difference between closed versus open captions and when it's better to use open captions? Absolutely. So um, closed captions can be turned on or off with usually a CC icon on a video player and open captions are burned directly onto the video file. So they can't be burned. So they can't be turned on or off. Um, closed captions are much more common, but a, a good example of when open captions may be preferred is uh, something like uh, a kiosk at an airport um, where uh, you don't have control over over the the end user as much um, or, or as much control over the video platform. So that's kind of the main consideration. Great. Uh, this one is for Jim. Uh, what format would you consider to be the most accessible to screen readers for fillable forms? HTML or PDF, or is there another format? I'm I'm somewhat biased because we we live I live primarily in the in the PDF world. Um, if we make the PDFs accessible correctly, the forms will be uh, very accessible. The fields and we do this quite often. Uh, there's a again a, a lot of work behind deciding if something is a text input if it's a checkbox versus a radio button. Uh, HTML can do similar or provide similar functionality. Again, there's, there's the, uh, a close overlap between the two technologies. Uh, but if, uh, if I had to uh, venture, I guess I, I would prefer the, the PDF world, but I'm, I'm a little bit biased in that regard, to be fair. And we have one last one here for Will. I recently received a question for digital software. Is WCAG 2.1 level Level A legally required or only level A for software type applications? So it ultimately depends on what the procurement process is. Oftentimes, when we're looking at certain government entities, they might specify the specific level of accessibility that might be required or provided. The general guidance, since not knowing your specific industry, 
uh, is to look at WCAG 2.1 ANAA, as that's the most applicable to almost all industries. Uh, Section 508 encapsulates pretty much all of the web content accessibility guidelines as well with additional considerations. So <clears throat> it might make the most sense to ensure that you're getting specifics on what level of conformance they're seeking, but ultimately trying to potentially exceed that. Okay, so, well, we're approaching the end of our time today, so I'm going to begin to start wrapping up our session. One last item before we end our time together, I ask you to respond to one final question. Now, if you're feeling deja vu, there is a reason. This is the same question I had asked at the beginning of the session, and we're very curious to observe any differences in the group's response. So again, please answer it honestly. Doing so will help us evaluate our effectiveness. Please note that your responses are anonymous, and answering the question honestly is essential to helping us understand your needs and our effectiveness. So please take a quick moment to answer it. The question should be appearing on the right hand side of your screen. And the question is, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your understanding of digital accessibility services and why it is important? Please use the scale one equaling very little understanding while five equals extensive understanding. And we'll give WebEx a few seconds to tally up the responses. Okay, so it looks like we're more fours and fives versus threes and fours. So uh, good job, panelists. Uh, I think we achieved our goal for the day. Uh, thank you everyone for completing this question again. As I briefly mentioned earlier, immediately following today's event, you will be asked to complete a survey about your experience. We strongly encourage you to please do so in order to help us continue to provide valuable sessions moving forward. If you'd like to learn more about digital accessibility services at the Viscari Center, please contact either myself or Jim Corporal. Our contact information is now listed on the screen, and you could simply go to www.viscaricenter.org forward slash digital dash accessibility dash services, and simply fill out the digital accessibility interest form, and someone will reach out to you as soon as possible. This has truly been an excellent discussion, and I know we've barely scratched the surface on this important topic. Today's session has been recorded and will be made available on the Viscardi Center website within two weeks from today and can be accessed for future reference. Will, Jim, and Lily, you have been absolutely fantastic, and we greatly appreciate you taking the time today to share your knowledge with us. And finally, thank you to our audience for joining us here today as well. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion. And just to remind you, the Viscardi Center greatly values your input and we hope you will complete the survey that will pop up on your screens immediately following this session. Once again, my name is Mike Caprera, and we thank you for joining us today. Have a great day.